Welcome to the Drummer's Debate Podcast, Episode 5. And today, we have... Alex Cohen. Alex Cohen, one of the infamous best metal drummers in New York City. Is that okay to say? Sure. <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't say it's true, but uh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, so today's topic is life as a drummer. Cool. Um, or as a musician in general, in New York City, it's just hard to be a full-time musician and live off of it. Yes, it is. How do you do it? Combination of things. Um, teaching, performing, and recording, as well as doing work for uh, for Drumhead Magazine and, uh, and Sick Drummer Magazine, helping get a lot of students. So, yeah, I do Skype lessons. I do in-person lessons. I do recording out at the studio in PA, um, Solitude Studios. And uh, then I do a lot of performing in the city and uh, touring as well. So that sort of makes me, I try to be well-rounded that way. Nice. Now, are you saying that you couldn't live off of drumming, just drumming alone? Like, so it's a combination of things. You're not just drumming. You're yes. doing publications. You're doing social media. You're doing tours. You're promoting yourself. Yes. Um, so there's a ton of things behind that behind just playing the drums that you're doing to make this a living. Absolutely. And do you find it like really difficult or? Yeah, it's incredibly difficult. Um, first, you know, the social media thing is a, a big component of, I think, today's modern music scene. Um, sorry, something's in my. Uh, today's modern music scene. And in order to stay relevant on there, you just got to put out <clears throat> content and really be consistent with it. Otherwise, you're going to get kind of buried underneath an avalanche of other drummers putting stuff out and you know you really have to stay on top of that so that's one thing the other thing is coming out with consistently good content and actively trying to keep people interested in what you're doing and sort of grow your name that way uh that's a, another big challenge because you know you have to think to yourself what am i doing that someone would want to watch or what am i doing where someone would not immediately shut it off because they've seen it before or it's boring or it's just sort of mundane. And so I think to me that's been a big component of how I've gone about marketing myself and developing sort of, I guess, whatever name I have and meeting a lot of my closest friends. Um, you know, that's how I reconnected with Tobias Ralph. That's uh, how I met uh, people like Samantha Landa and uh, others like that. Um, and connected with a lot of drummers around the world. So, yeah, it, you know, it's, it, that's definitely been good. And then the, the sick drummer thing came about because I was doing the malignancy gig, and that was, uh, yeah, it's a very hard gig. Um, playing malignancy, Mike. that's the name of the band? Yes. Uh, it, it, and that was copying Mike Heller's parts, who now plays in Fear Factory. And those parts are incredibly difficult to play. And so they were interested in that because they had worked with Mike in the past. And so it was really cool that they let me write lessons and do uh, columns for them because that really got me exposure as an educator as well, especially amongst the metal community. And um, really kind of solidified me as, okay, I, I can teach this stuff and I at least have something to teach when it comes to learning some more difficult concepts. Uh, yeah, so it's a combination of a lot of things. That's a lot. Jeez. I got to do all that? Uh, to be a drummer in New York City? Y y you know what? <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're putting in more of a niche market, yes. I mean, I, there's plenty of guys I know, you know, if you play, you can play gigs that pay better, but I kind of tend to shift toward, um, uh, I wouldn't say, it, it's, I, I could definitely understand why someone wouldn't like the way that a person like myself or Travis Orban or some of the other very technical players play. Um, some people think it sounds sterile or it sounds stiff or sort of too ironed out. What are you I, talking about in general? Like a blast beat? Or do, just in general, the way we play, the way where we've really focused on lining ourselves up to a metronome and sort of making our time very scrubbed clean, I guess I would call it. It should be, I think. I mean, if you're recording to a click, it should be clean. I would, yeah, exactly. I just... I know that some people think my playing sounds stiff or it's sort of a little too accurate for their taste. What? <laughs> Who told you this? Uh, 
gotten told that a couple times actually. You're too accurate for my taste. It's. Uh, I mean, I mean, it depends on the genre too, because I think like. Yeah, it's metal is good, but other genres. You yeah. Know, sometimes it doesn't really translate yeah. as well. Like maybe soul. Some people like to play yeah. behind the metronome a little bit or Ex- forward. I, yeah, exactly. But a lot of that stuff is accidental too, so I don't. I don't really yeah. know. Uh, it, you know, and so that to me, I I understand why why you know people wouldn't really wouldn't like I guess how I feel time that way because I guess my whole priority was just trying to be really close with the metronome. That's new to me. I've never heard that perspective from anyone ever. Yeah. Like I've never been in a recording situation and a person tell me you're too you're too perfect. Like you're too close to the metronome. You sound like a machine. Yeah, that's. I mean, uh, that's 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 very strange. Uh, that's you know, very strange. It's it's definitely, and again, you know, I've been trying to to work on it. Um, it's nothing to work on. You should not work on that. If you if you're perfect on the metronome, why is anybody? Why would anybody complain? Well, you know, about certain that? songs would want a different feel. For example, you know, yeah, like soul music or some hip hop, you wouldn't want it right on the metronome. You sort of want it behind the beat or. Being able to sway the beat a little bit, feel the gray, the gray notes between this sp- or gray space between the notes, and to me, that's I, I've just always been a very aligned sort of. I really wanted everything in its place and everything to sound really uh, sort of gridded and precise. And I'm the same way. You know what made me that way? Because writing parts, I used to do it through MIDI, and MIDI used to align with the grid. Exactly. And when I would record myself. And I'm so I'm so used to hearing the meaty tracks. If I'm not perfect, it didn't sound right to me personally. Exactly, yeah. and that to me was just one of the things. I guess. Well, it was also I was working a lot of the stuff that I was practicing was stuff from uh, the Thomas Lang book and the Marco Miniman book and the Virgil Donati book, and that stuff was all about limb alignment and the micro timing relation between limbs and really making sure that you were aligning all and aligning all these overlapping ostinatos and phrases, but actually doing it in a way where all your limbs were synced up. And that was, I I think a big reason why I sort of became obsessed with gritting this stuff out. Like independence, but in a synced way. (laughs) It's i I'll put it this way. If you want your soul to be swallowed whole, a really good way is to work on the Marco Miniman books <laughs> and the Thomas Lang books. I've heard, I've heard. I'm going to get into that, actually, because I've heard a lot of good things about those books. And it being able to you see enhance this, you, you as you a You see this look on my face? <laughs> yeah. Just like... Makes you dark. Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, who did I f- follow? I, I followed Antonio Sanchez, and he told me. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I not told me personally, but in an interview that he did, he told me that those books are... Um, very very difficult and it puts you in a real dark place in terms of studying it and getting those parts down i suffered two nervous breakdowns during the marco miniman book (laughs) uh it was a bad time in my life too granted but at the same time the book what they do and how they consume your whole thought process it's it's scary it sort of flips your brain around as far as how you're conceiving the instrument and just how you're thinking in general. You Suddenly you're thinking with four quadrants of your brain. Right. And I can see why Antonio would say that because it, 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 you go to a weird place with those books. You know, and Marco's especially because it was so focused on the... The line book is very focused on a matrix of, of overlapping patterns. Whereas the Marco book is really more focused on melodic patterns and all the infinite combinations you can put them together. With it making sense to the ear. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's where suddenly your head turns around. Yeah, that's crazy. And I also wanted to, I mean, another thing that I was really into was trying to get my feet to even out what my hands uh, we're doing and I wanted my feet to literally be able to play exactly what my hands could play including three strokes and doubles singles I mean my singles and my feet still suck I'll be the first to tell you that <laughs> um, but you know definitely a lot of that stuff I really wanted to be able to sort of trade vocabulary between between limbs and really just kind of feel like I was in control of every single limb that was operating in its own hemisphere wow that's difficult um, now let me ask you this question 
even though I'm veering off topic. A lot of people told me in comments and stuff and messages that I tend to veer off topic a lot, but it's a podcast. <laughs> Good. I just, you know what, man? We're just two dudes <laughs> yeah. talking here. Yeah. So, yeah. The, the, so when you said uh, like separating limbs and, mm -hmm. and just splitting your mind into four different parts, would you say that that's more of a muscle memory and repetition thing? that where you can shut one part of your brain off and then just focus on another part because the rest of your body has that muscle memory? Well, or? The, it goes even beyond that. It's You don't even want to shut that part of your brain off. You want that part of your brain to literally think in a different rate than this part of your brain. And it's almost like thinking within, within two... It, literally, it's almost like thinking with two brains in that you need to have one ostinato or one phrase if you're doing a repetitive phrase within muscle memory but it's not turning it off necessarily because you need to be paying enough attention to that phrase in that it will align with whatever other one you're playing and you're and still playing accurate. whatever limb is following is still on that exactly same tempo. and so it's then then it gets even more complicated when you actively start subbing out your limbs to put cross rhythms against said patterns that's crazy. Let me ask you another question, which was something that I could never do. <clears throat> I find it really mind-boggling, intense, and just ridiculous. Dennis Chambers used to do something where he used to just do like triplets on his foot, like he just keep that going for like five minutes while he's playing a jazz shuffle on his hands. But while he's playing the triplets on his feet, it always stays in time, and the jazz shuffle is going from very low tempo to very fast tempo and swaying back and forth tempo-wise while his feet are still in the same damn tempo. Well, I how, did, how is that possible? Well, Dennis has perfect time. Uh, I, I do think that Dennis's time is naturally perfect. He's just, you know, he's a very gifted drummer. As yeah, you know. yeah. Um, but really what that is, is either, it's Dennis either feeling the gray space between the notes. Like, you know, the Schofield track, Blue Matter? Yeah. Okay, you know that first groove where it's like sort of go-go groove and Dennis is playing these ghost notes against mm -hmm. that, where it just sounds like the stick is falling in whatever place and it just sort of has this drag effect. Mm -hmm. Similar type thing. I think Dennis just has that brain where he just feels time, um, you know, just as a very liquid thing. And I think that he's not even thinking consciously about a modulation as much as he's thinking just about where his hands are falling, you know, over it's his feet. Crazy, man. But the thing is, and you see some of these guys like Pete Zeldman or some of what you know what Virgil's doing, Virgil Donati's doing, mm -hmm. um, or the, there there are other people as uh, other this, uh, Grant Collins is another one. Guys where they're really it's very calculated and methodical. And I feel like, and Vinny Kali, you just another one where I just think Vinny just, that's in him, the same way that it's in Dennis, what, they, what they've done. Uh, but the, with the modulations, the way that I usually think about it, and I, I actually have a form of synesthesia where I can actually see things sort of as images. So I, I sort of feel the modulation and see it as... Um, like a grid in your head or seven, something? Seven is green to me. <laughs> it's weird. It's Whatever like that grand, means, seven, I don't know what you're saying right now. An associated color that I have with the number and an associated I feeling okay. I have with the number, okay. you know. Um, and so I, I see it like that, and I sort of see where the trajectory will go as far as how I'm placing something over whatever constant ostinato is happening. You know, so be like if I was doing like. And you're still in time. It just yeah, doesn't just, sound like it, it's it just in time. doesn't yeah. sound like so. So you mm -hmm. know, then you would. Sounds like, yeah, like it sounds yeah. like not in time, but I know it is in yeah, time. Yeah, it's, it's just. <laughs> so that's five in the left hand. Mm -hmm. So it's flam taps in the feet. Then we have five in the left hand. So. See, that's where it starts to get real dark. <laughs> and that's three in the right hand. So, you know, I just kind of think about that in ways where um, I, I just sort of align the limbs. That just, they kind of fall is, wherever is they Is this just go. something that you do for yourself? Or, or 
This is you, this is not something that you you ever used on. If I ever use this, right? I get fired. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, exactly, and, and, and for good reason. It sounds terrible. Half the time, yeah, exactly. Honestly. It's more just something that I do because I, I it's it's kind of cool if you can think in those rates like that, and it opens up some sort of you know different ideas and different sort. Uh, it, it really expands your concept of time and how to feel time, and then also just polyrhythmically, just some of the phrases you can stretch over time and create with. Right. Um, sort of like painting with a different palette or speaking a, a slightly different dialect. Got it, got it. Now, let's go back to, uh, you know, just life as a drummer in general. Mm -hmm. what, what do you find, like, the most difficult thing to do as, as is it being on a road, is it... Being on the road is very being, hard for me. Yeah. Um, I'm a guy who I, I like my routine. I like familiarity, and being on being on the road is stressful. And what's so stressful about it? Dude, there's no routine. There's a lot. A lot of things are up in the air. You're always in a different place. You don't know what's happening a lot of the time. You, there's travel plans. There's delays. The bus can break down. You know, there's so many different factors. Yeah. And it's that's very stressful for me. Yeah, I've only been on one tour in my life, and I say it's. Uh, the worst experience I've ever had in my life, but the best experience I've ever, ever had in That's my life. That's a very, very good, good way of describing it. I know for me, at least the tour, you know, the tour, I, it, they've been amazing growing experiences and uh, I've been lucky to tour with some really wonderful people. So there, there was that, but at the same time, it's just, it's very hard on me mentally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Not only I, that, but just like eating healthy on the road. Oh, and, dude, yeah. And sleep. Yeah. Uh, the eating healthy part's really hard. Yeah. I, uh, you, you end up eating a lot of junk food. You know, because you, the, you'll pull over at a rest stop or something like that and you walk in and, you know, what's, what's that? Either you got like a banana and a cliff bar or something. You know? <laughs> and a McDonald's right next door with oh, all the burgers dude, you can yeah. eat. <laughs> and then like, you know, there's Cinnabon right near the McDonald's. Oh, God. I know. So it's, uh, it's that step. Being on the road is, is stressful for me. Okay. And what do you feel like is, is least stressful for you? I love recording. Recording. Yeah, I love recording mm -hmm. drum tracks. I Me just, too. Me too. I just when I'm in, when I'm in my studio, I'm in you know out in PA at Solitude. I'm in my happy place. I got all those Pisces symbols around me, which you know I put. I just I I, I love the the process and the creative aspect and the fact that I'm actually at the same time micro analyzing my own playing mm -hmm. and listening back and improving by. You know, hearing things I can get better at. And I, you're in your personal space. Exactly. And yeah. I'm just in my own environment. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I don't know how long that was, but uh, I guess we, we'll wrap it up. That was very informative. I really thank appreciate you. that. And Please. thank you guys so much for watching Drummer's Debate Episode 5 with Alex Cohen. Thank you so much. I'm Phil Larison, and I'll catch you guys next time.